Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis and Spencer Tracy in Dark Victory. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Each year, the actors, directors, producers, and other members of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences vote on the outstanding accomplishments of the year in Hollywood. The last Academy Award for the best performances by an actor and an actress went to Spencer Tracy and Betty Davis. Both these stars are with us tonight. And even the unemotional lights in front of the Lux Radio Theater have a special glow of pride in our players and our play, Dark Victory. Our stage is set for a prize-winning achievement. And so is the stage in your home when Lux Flakes is starred. Many domestic producers have discovered that casting Lux Flakes in a leading role is, is good business at the household box office. If there's a little more gray in my hair this week, believe me, it came from the task of finding the right dramatic material for two such splendid artists as Betty Davis and Spencer Tracy. In fact, we considered and rejected dozens of plays before selecting the one we think is perfect, Dark Victory. As a producer, I've always disliked the type of play known as a vehicle, one that's designed for the actor instead of the audience. And when there are two noted players in a cast, there's a double danger that the play will turn out to be a double vehicle. But Dark Victory has grip and power and human appeal. And when our curtain falls on the third act, I believe you'll agree with me that this play is really a great emotional experience. Each woman in our audience will unconsciously put herself in the place of Judith Traherne. Each man will wonder what he would have done as Dr. Frederick Steele. Dark Victory is a love story, but not one of the simple boy-meets-girl variety. It's the love story of two strong-willed people who must concentrate in a few gallant months all the happiness of a lifetime. Our footlights shine their brightest now, as the curtain rises on Act One of Dark Victory, starring Betty Davis as Judith Traherne and Spencer Tracy as Dr. Frederick Steele. At Miss Judith Traherne's estate on Long Island, another all-night party has run its course. It's just six o'clock in the morning as the last car swerves through the gate and the phone begins to jangle wildly. First in one room, then another. From the servants' quarters to the kitchen. And then at last, in the bedroom of Mr. Hearn's secretary and companion. Hello? Mr. Hearn's secretary speaking. Well, good morning, Miss Hearn. It's a cheerful day now, isn't it? Who is this? This is Michael over at the stable. Michael? What do you mean by calling at this hour? <laughs> I was wondering if I might speak to Miss Judith. You certainly might not. You know there was a party here. She hasn't had an hour's rest. Who is it? Not important. You better go back to sleep. Now, don't argue, Doc. Hello. This is Miss Judith Traherne of the Sleepy Trahernes. Is it now? Well, this is Mr. Michael O'Leary of the Wide Awake O'Learys. We've got a customer for that cold of yours. He's down at the stable now. We can get 10,000 if we snatch it quick. If you mean challenger, Michael, not 10 and not 20. My head's just woozy, not vacant. If you don't mind my saying so, Miss Traherne, it might be a good idea for you to take charge of the cups and ribbons and leave the handling of the horses to me. I do mind your saying so. You had your orders last night. I ought to slap that man's face. Michael's impregnant sometimes, but he's just about the best trainer money can buy. Help me up, Dolly. I'm going down to the stable. Will you, please? Ooh. Oh. Well, you know, I, I'm absolutely giddy. Look at me. What is it? Another headache? Mm. A hangover you could hang your hat on. Oh, from what? You didn't touch a drop last night. Oh, I did so, gallant. No, you didn't. I watched you. As fast as you were handed cocktails, you slipped them into the flower bowls. It was your petunias that got tight, not you. Well, why can't I walk straight then? You're silly if you don't believe me. Judith, I don't like the way... You... I'm going to send for Dr. Parsons. No. Why not, Judith? Now, listen, I'll be all right in a minute. Be a darling, Anne. Get my things, will you? And tell John to bring up the car. Tell him to hurry. I don't know what Michael got me down here for, Judith. That he said you wanted to sell that Colt. Well, I, I don't, Colonel Mansell. I still think you should buy him, Colonel. Michael, shut up. That Colt's a perfect darling. He could play on the lawn with the dogs or the children. Of course, unfortunately, a steeplechaser has to have guts. 
catch this fellow at the two-mile pole with his heart bursting and a water jump ahead, and he'll fold up on you. Michael, I said I wanted to run him this morning. Where is he? He's in his stall, having his extra 40 winks before we give him his morning cup of tea. Get him out here. And when I tell you to do something, you do it. Yes, ma'am. Right away, ma'am. Well, I'm sorry, Judith. I'd like to make a deal. Oh, don't I... go away, Colonel. I want to take him over the jumps. <gasps> Judith, is it your head again? <sighs> well, it comes and goes. And I'll show him if that horse has courage. Here's your fine horse, Miss Judith. Shall I give you a hand up? Up you go. Thanks. Michael, how long have I had you? One month and three days. Reminds me to think about firing you. Oh, you'll not be firing me, Miss Judith. We're going to get on together. <laughs> Just because I call your darling a coward. Someday you'll learn, Michael, that courage is in the blood. When any of us hits that last hurdle, that's all that counts. Sure, sure. And I'll take your little horse and go along. <laughs> Michael, she's not going to take the high jumps, is she? Looks like it. But she's leading him in wrong. Stay over to your left, Miss Judith. Oh! Where? Oh, I thought she was going to fall. She will if she comes around like that again. Miss Judith! You're way off to the right. Come in straight for that jump. Who's riding this horse? What's the matter with her? Miss Judith, straighten out. You'll trace the wing. Look out. Look out. It's a gash on the head, but it was you we were worried about. Michael said he had a hunch he'd throw you. And, and listen to me, that uh, colt didn't throw me. I threw him. What do you mean? Do you know what happened? I saw two jumps. I tried to put him over the wrong one. You saw two jumps? Yes, that was it. It was the ghastliest feeling. Everything went fuzzy. Why didn't you tell that to Dr. Parsons? Oh, poor old befuddled Parsons. My dear, you're staying up too late, smoking too many cigarettes. <laughs> if only he knew about last week at the colony, when the old lady was coming out of the swing doors and knocked the umbrella out of her hand. Why? Somebody said I was drunk. <laughs> and another time coming out of Helene's on Park Avenue, I ran right into a woman with her dog on a leash. I ran right into the leash. Judith, you... Oh, I didn't hurt the dog, but the woman was furious. <laughs> darling, darling, confidentially, this is more than a hangover. Well, if you don't tell Parsons these things, I will. Ah, no, you won't, Anne. You're my truest and best friend, and you won't tell a soul. I, uh, I wouldn't have told you, except that I won't have a dumb animal blamed for my mistake. Come on now, we're going to town, aren't we? Judith, Parsons is coming back. Why? I promised we'd go with him to a specialist about this giddy... I haven't time for doctors. But you may be really ill. But I haven't time to be ill. Come in. Dr. Parsons is here, Miss Judith. Oh, boy. Well, Judith, are we ready to go? No, Dr. Darling, we're not. She says she's not going with you. Why, but Judith, I, I think you ought to. There's a man in town, Dr. Steele. Now, Dr. Darling, I've got much too much to do, you know that. You take Anne to Dr. Steele. <laughs> she could use an examination. <laughs> oh, Anne, haven't you any influence over her? None at all. Oh! What was that? Oh! Martha, oh! what's the matter? Miss Judith! Miss Judith! She fell down the stairs! Hello? Hello, I can't hear you. Yes, this is Dr. Steele's nurse. No, I'm afraid it'd be useless. Dr. Steele has closed his office. Permanently, yes. No, he's not coming back. You're welcome. Goodbye. Sounds good, eh, Wainwright? If you want to hear a fine woman break down and sob, Dr. Steele, just keep talking like that. <laughs> Have to leave in 45 minutes. Remember that now. Well, what about this case of Dr. Parsons? He's very worried. Told me to keep you here by force if necessary. You tell old Parsons I've waited nine years for this train. I'm not going to miss it just because some Long Island glamour girl fell off her horse. Dr. Steele. Yeah? I wouldn't talk so loud. They're outside now. Who? Dr. Parsons and his patient. Wainwright. Well, I'm sorry, doctor, but he insisted. No, all right. Have to be polite, I suppose. Will you come in, Dr. Parsons? Thanks. Sit down, Dr. Parsons. Don't forget about that train, Wainwright. I won't. Steele, can't you put off leaving? I'm sorry, Parsons. I've closed my office. But why? I've told you. I'm through with private practice. You're going into research, is that it? That's it. I want to work on cells, brain cells. I want to find out why healthy cells suddenly go berserk, grow wild. Do you feel you can do as much for people that way as you have done in surgery? Yeah. More, if I have any luck, why? Because I have a patient who needs you, Steele. But, uh, please. I... The girl is desperately ill. She's been losing ground every day. I read your report. Well, if two minutes of talk will do any good, go ahead. What's this about headaches? She's been having them persistently. 
even before the accident. Before? She calls them hangovers. Ah. And you wait until now? <laughs> you don't know that girl. She's stubborn. Only yesterday, she went to a revival of Serrano in the afternoon and played bridge half the night. She won't cooperate. She won't even tell me anything. Mm -hmm. By the way, if she's such a crack horsewoman, why was she thrown? It was a, a queer sort of accident. She steered her horse into the right wing of a jump. What's that? You sure it was the right? Yes. Why? Ah, no. Well, I, uh, I think your best bet is to get in touch with Finley. Oh, Finley is in Europe. Well, I get Park. I don't want Park or any of the rest of them. Hang it all, they're no better than I am. I want you. But Parsons, the vice guard. You're always talking about the obligation of doctors to humanity. Well, there's humanity waiting for you in that room. Oh, all right. Have her come in. Thank you. Judith, come in. Judith, this is Dr. Steele. How do you do? My name's Traherne. Judith Traherne, or don't names matter. What's that? I mean to the cold scientific eye. We're guinea pigs, aren't we? Glad to have met you, Doctor. Wait a minute. How'd you get those burns on your hand? Where? On your right hand, right here, between the first two fingers. Well, I, uh, I never noticed them till now. Oh, I see. No. Wait outside, Judith. Won't you sit here? I haven't much time. Neither have I. Parsons tells me you're a great hunter. Well, you could hardly expect me to enter your office leading a pack of hounds. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> I understand you don't like to talk about your health. I don't. Any reason why? It's a boring topic, that's all. Most people love it. I make my living by listening to them. Then I'm afraid you're wasting your time. Oh, I'll send you a bill. I'm 23 years old, an only child. I weigh 115 pounds, stripped. I've had mumps, measles, and whooping cough, all at the proper ages. I take a great deal of exercise. I'm accustomed to a reasonable quantity of tobacco and alcohol. I'm said to have a sense of humor. Is that all? That's all the inconsequential facts. What are the consequential ones? Does that light from the window bother you? No. Use your eyes a great deal? I generally keep them open, Doctor. <laughs> what on earth do you do with yourself down there on Long Island? Oh, horses, dogs, shooting, yachting, parties, travel, gossip. All the pleasures of the station wagon crowd. You don't think much of that, do you? No, not much. Why not? Well, it just doesn't appeal to me. Do you condemn everything that doesn't appeal to you, Dr. Steele? Oh, no, 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 by no means. You asked for my opinion and I gave it. Well, anyway, that's my racket. What's yours? <laughs> Well, I've been a surgeon up to now, but I'm clearing out for northern Vermont in about 30 minutes. Vermont? Not real. Mm-hmm. No kidding. <laughs> what are you going to do up there between yawns? You wouldn't be interested. Oh, come now, after leading me on like this. Well, I'm going to do scientific research on the growth of cells. In guinea pigs? No, no, just cells. Sounds silly. Yeah, so I'm told. Still, you know, you know, I almost envy you. It must be nice to believe in what you're doing. Why, don't you? Oh, not in the way you do. I'm not complaining. Take it all in all, they dealt me a very good hand. I'm young. I have no particular responsibilities. I shan't cultivate them either, once free or without. Oh, I shall probably marry someday. No hurry about that. When I do, I shall build a house on a ridge I know, the glorious view. I'll have my horses, and with luck, I'll have about 40 years of it. I think that's a pretty good setup. That light is in your eyes. Oh, I wish you wouldn't keep hopping on that. There's nothing the matter with my eyes. You're squinting. I'm not squinting. I'll put the blinds down. There. There, that's better. Well, suit yourself. It's your office. What did you do yesterday? I played bridge in the afternoon. I went to the theater in the evening. It was the other way around, wasn't it? Why, uh, yes, I guess it was. What was the play? Um, Cyrano, wasn't it? Well, yes, why? Did you like it? Well, my head was aching. How long have you had these headaches? Oh, I, uh, I don't have them. You have one now? No, I have not. How did you come out at bridge yesterday? Well, let me think. Quickly. I, I don't remember. I know, you lost. Yes, I lost. How much? Well, how can I remember? I play bridge every day. You've been losing a lot lately, haven't you? Well, yes. Playing badly? I, um... Forgetting what the cards are and what's the bid? Why do you ask me these stupid questions? Wait a minute. Did Parsons say you could go out yesterday? I'm accustomed to looking after myself. But you did disobey his orders, didn't well, you? But what if I did? Well, why pay a doctor to advise you and then disregard his advice? I didn't call him. Someone else called him. So you're taking orders from someone else, aren't you? Doctor, listen to me. I've never taken orders from anyone. And as long as I live, I shall never take orders from anyone. And here's something else. I'm well. Absolutely well. I'm young and strong and nothing can touch me. Neither you nor Dr. Parsons can make an invalid out of me. And now I'm going. I'm sorry to have wasted so much of your time. This is my last interview with Dr. That's right. Run away because you're frightened. That isn't true. Come on over here. Now sit down. I want to talk with you. You held certain things back from Dr. Parsons because you were afraid to admit them. 
You didn't tell him that you've been having these headaches for months. But you have, and they've been getting worse lately until now you're never free of them. And your eyes have been cutting up, too, just as though someone was shutting a pair of folding doors until your vision is almost cut in half. You pretended it was imagination, but it isn't. Then that queer, dull feeling in your right arm, you couldn't laugh that off. I'll tell you how you got those burns, a cigarette. It burned your fingers and you never felt it because your tactile nerves are paralyzed. Your memory is all shot to pieces. You can't concentrate. Look at your bridge scores. You're irritable because your nerves are all on edge. You're afraid to admit it, but you can't deny it. Now, that's true, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is true. I I can't deny it. Then why don't you let me help you? Dr. Steele, you have to leave now if you're going to catch that train. Train? Train. Yeah, well, there'll be other trains on other days. Doctor. Cancel the tickets. Yes, doctor. Oh, thank you very much for staying. Not at all, not at all. A few days, one way or the other, won't matter. I, I'm sorry I was so difficult. I like the way you fought back at me. You've been a good sport. <laughs> Well, if I weren't that doctor, I'm afraid I wouldn't be much of anything. Tell me, what's wrong with me? Is it my eyes? Now, I'd be a poor excuse for a doctor if I told you before I'm positive myself. For the next few days, I'm going to ask you to have some x-rays taken, lots of them. Otherwise, you're to live your normal life, do everything you've been doing, see your friends, have parties, everything the same, with one exception. What's that? You'll have to see a good deal of me. (laughs) I'll bet you'll be a frost at a party. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Dr. Steele, have you reached the verdict? Yes. The prisoner will rise. The sentence? We will have to operate. Operate? On me? Where? My, uh, my head? Yes. Oh, no, no, I won't, I won't, I won't! Dr. Walker, in surgery, please. Dr. Carvel, administration, please. Dr. Carvel. Good morning. How is everything? Everything is awful. Look what you make me wear. (laughs) The operating gown? Pretty dowdy, aren't they? I suppose you brought a lot of nice things of your own. Well, of course I did. I have lovely nighties. I bought two new ones, especially for this. Miss Anne, I I see no reason why Mr. Hearn shouldn't wear something of her own. They're in the drawer. Have them ready for her when she gets back in the operating room, will you? And now, Mr. Hearn, how about drinking this? Well, what is it? Now, it's just something that makes you sleep. Right down. Ugh. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I don't want to go to sleep. How could anyone sleep in a two-by-four like this? At home, I have a bed big enough for six, and here I can't move. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll show you something nice about this bed. See, it goes up to rest your legs. It goes up and down to make your back feel better. Why, before you're through, you want to take it home with you. <laughs> You know, you do make it feel better. I, I, I can't understand me. I've never given in a fraction to anyone else. And here I am letting you bounce me up and bounce me down. <laughs> in fact, I'm letting you... Tell me. Exactly where? Where does it happen? Here, in my head? That's my worry. Doctor, how do you do it? Just what do you do? Shatterbox, aren't you? Ah, it is very distasteful, isn't it? Oh, well, I don't care. I don't care about anything. This is such a nice bed. And it's a nice room, too. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Anne, you're standing over there miles away. Come over here. I love you, Anne. I don't know what I'd do without you. I love you. <laughs> do you and the doctor like each other? Of course. Sure. I want you to like each other. Because, you see, I love everybody. Will I cut off my hair? Just a little of it. But I don't want my hair cut off. It'll grow back. Oh, oh yes. Of course it will. Isn't that silly of me? I feel so good. Nothing to think about. You're going to sleep now. That's right. I must do everything you say. I'm in your hands, Doctor. Ah, they're such nice hands. Nice, strong hands. Doctor? Yes? When you get inside my head, see if you can find any sense in it. She's asleep. Hello? Dr. Steele speaking. Will you call surgery? We're ready now. Well, 
How is she? The operation was a complete success. Go on. I told you what to expect before we operated. She's bound to have a recurrence. An invalid, I suppose. No. No, I'd say it's a rare case. She'll apparently be as well as any of us. That is, until... Well, her sight may fail near the end. Amblyopia? Yes. There'll only be a few hours after that. Oh, hang it, Steele. I... Isn't there anything we can do? Anything at all? No, no, there's nothing. It's a rotten business, Doctor. Uh... A girl like that, so alive, so entitled to live, to have this contemptible, meaningless growth come along and put a period to it, you could almost wish it had happened on the table. Are you going to tell her? Would you want her to know? No. Well, then that's the answer. Steele, just one more thing. You said she'd have a recurrence and then a few hours of life. How long has she got before the recurrence? Well, I can't say exactly. But she'll die within a year. <laughs> You have just heard Act One of Dark Victory, starring Spencer Tracy and Betty Davis. Mr. DeMille brings you Act Two in just a moment. But first, I have some important news for you. Listen a moment and you'll hear how it sounds over the wires. The telegraph is saying just three words. Here's what they are. New Quick Lux. Yes, that's our big news for millions of housewives. News about a marvelous new Quick Lux that suds with almost unbelievable speed. You know, I thought Lux Flakes just couldn't be improved. It's so swell. Well, Sally, I've heard lots of women say just that. It's so safe, so gentle, so easy on your hands or your clothes, we couldn't make it milder. But here's what scientists working for years in the laboratories have done. They found a way to speed up Lux Flakes. They've added an ingredient costing many thousands of dollars a year, which makes new quick Lux give you suds in a second. So fast, well, it's almost unbelievable. You'll think so, too, when you pour out these delicate shearer flakes. Why, you turn on the water, and they bubble into suds like veritable magic. In water, as cool as your hand, New Quick Lux dissolves three times faster than any of ten other leading soaps tested. Flakes, chips, beads, and bars. Yet you can get this wonderful New Quick Lux at no extra cost. Here's another grand point. New Quick Lux goes further, gives more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of these other soaps. It's so very thrifty to use, and it's so gentle, so safe for everything safe in water. Why not stop at your grocer's tomorrow and say, new quick lux, please? Your grocer has it. It's in the same familiar box, but it's the wonderful new quick lux flakes. It suds faster, it's thrifty, it's so safe. You'll love it. Now our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Dark Victory, starring Spencer Tracy as Dr. Frederick Steele and Betty Davis in the role of Judith Trahern, with Lorene Tuttle as Anne. In a few weeks, Judith returned from the hospital. A new Judith, with sparkling eyes and steady hands. She's invited some friends to celebrate her recovery. As she moves gaily among them, Dr. Steele watches from the doorway, his face drawn, his eyes filled with pity. At last, Judith sees him and runs quickly to him. Doctor, where in the world have you been? Hello, Judith. My friend, this is the gentleman who did my operation. Dr. Steele, my gang. How do you do? Now, come over here. I want to speak to you. You're late, you know. I was at the hospital. Ah, oh, never mind that. We're not interested in medicine here. Sit down, won't you? Have some champagne? No, thanks. I had one. I said I could. Have you been a good girl? No. Well, I thought not. Did you drive into town for lunch and come right back? Father, I cannot tell a lie. What did you do? I bought these shoes. Like them? Mm-hmm. They're very pretty. What else? This dress and some other new frocks that will stun you. Oh, thank you so very much for the two inches off my middle. 
And doctor, thank you for my life. What can I ever do for you? Oh, Anne. Anne! Coming! Hot. Excuse me, doctor. Anne, has the package come yet? Just arrived. Shall I get it? No, let me. Be right back. Don't go away. Well, doctor, doesn't she look wonderful? Aren't you proud? Proud? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm very proud. Doctor, when you came down to Judith's room right after the operation, you had a certain look in your face. I thought it was a strain, the tension of the operation. I don't understand you. Well, you have that same look in your face now. Is there anything wrong? Anne, I'd rather not. If there is, please. You see, I am her best friend. Will you come outside? Well? Are you strong enough to hear the truth? Then there is something. Yes, there is. I can't save her, Anne. Nothing can, nothing. You mean she's going Yes. She'll die. Well, so are we all. She's going to die of that growth through which we operate. No. It's true. You mean she'll have that pain again? And that, that horrible confusion? No, she's not going to suffer again. That's all behind her now. How will it come? It'll come quietly, peacefully. Oh, God's last small mercy. You mean it will come without warning? She'll have no chance to be ready. There may be a moment very near the end when she won't be able to see quite as usual. She'll go blind? A dimming of vision. Then after a few hours, say two or three... Doctor, how long has she? A year? Six months? Possibly more. Oh, I don't believe it. And if I could literally cut off his arm... I know, I know. You'll have to buck up. She mustn't know. You sneak. You're hiding out on me. What's the idea? Well, actually, we were talking about just how much you ought to do. I told him you'd had a devil of a day, and he doesn't seem to think it matters. I've had the best day of my life. Doctor, here's a present for you. Oh, Judith, you should Oh, now, don't play surprise. You know, you doctors always expect your GP presence. And if I'm not a grateful patient, there never was one. What's in it? A little gold and a lot of sentiment. Look at that man, Anne. I thought surgeons had to have such steady hands. Let me help you, doctor. Thank you. Well, do you like them? Or don't you wear cufflinks? Thank you very much. It's the best present I've ever had. Oh, I'm so glad you like them. Of course it isn't enough. Nothing ever could be. Wait, I have an idea. This is my birthday. What? Well, it is really, you know, my new birthday. Every year on this date, we'll meet. Just us three. We'll meet and have a party. Hi, what's the matter? Nothing. It's a grand idea. Of course it is. Come on, we'll start now. Anne? Anne, do you think we ought to dress for dinner tonight? Give him a bit of swish? Just as you please. My first real weekend. Marvelous. Anne, you will put on your best dignity, won't you, and help me keep dignified? Judith... Look at me. I'm looking at you. You're in love. Yes. I thought so. What about him? Has he given you any encouragement? Not a ripple on the water. Drives me crazy. But when I just think of him, I... And it's awful, but it's wonderful. You know, for the first time I get up in the morning with something to live for? Something besides horses and hats and food? Oh, Anne, he's very fine, isn't he? He's worthwhile, isn't he? But, oh, if only the Spaniards or the French had settled New England instead of the Pilgrims. But if he's given you no sign, then how do you know? Now, Anne, darling, don't be against me. He didn't go away, did he? That's one sign. Huh? Keep both fingers crossed for me, please. One day it'll happen to you, darling, and then you'll know. <laughs> Come in, Ann. I got your call. It's trouble. We have something to talk about, Doctor. Yes? Does Judith mean anything more to you than... than just a patient? Perhaps it's impertinent of me to ask. No, it isn't. I think I know. You do care for her. Yes, I care. Very much. But what are you going to do? Are you going to tell her? She'll expect you to marry her. Or is it better for you to go away and... And leave it to us. Well? You know, Anne, women have never meant anything to me before. 
I'd never met anyone like her. I was all set to I had plans, arrangements made. Yes, Vermont. Why don't you go away for your own sake? For your work? Work? When I can't cure her? There's nothing else on my mind. Look here, I had a letter from Vienna today, the last finding in the case. Here's the translation. Not a chance in the world. And the others, 12 of them. Prognosis negative. Prognosis negative. Prognosis negative. Oh, I'm so sorry for you both. You couldn't marry her. You couldn't watch her growing happier every day with this thing creeping up behind her back. Could you stand it? I couldn't. It isn't a question of what you or I could stand. The only thing that matters is that she should be happy every hour. All my life I've told people what to do. Now, Anne, what shall we do? What can we do? She isn't home yet, Martha? Yes, Miss Judith. She said she was going into town. And then I heard her call Dr. Steele's number. Dr. Steele? Oh, I see. Well... Judith, I'm back. Oh, there she is now. You may go, Martha. Yes, Miss. Oh. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. Where, where have you been? Oh, uh, for a drive. Where to? To town. What for? Oh, I, uh... And where did you go? Judith, please. Hello, hello. How are you, Anne? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I stumble into something? Yes. We were just on the verge of a jealous scene about you. What? Judith, don't. I I suppose I'd better go. You didn't mean that, Judith. Darling, you poor fool. Don't you know I'm in love with you? Well, of course I've made an idiot of myself. Naturally, you must be embarrassed. You see, you've been proposed to. Well, well, all you have to say is that you don't want me. But I do want you. I came here today to tell you I wanted you. Oh, my darling. Judith. Judith, darling. Hey, anybody home? How do you do, Mr. Hearn? The doctor's not here. Where is he? I'm to have lunch with him. He wants you to meet him at the restaurant. Oh, I haven't seen you to congratulate you. Oh, oh, thank you, Wainwright. It's a strange world, isn't it? When I first came here, you were packing, and I thought it was the end of my life. Now you're still packing, but my life is just beginning. Huh. Wainwright, don't let me disturb you. I'll help pack up his papers and things. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. You know, Wainwright, it's nice to marry the man you love. Hmm? I darn nearly broke my neck to get him. Of course, it's a perfectly screwy setup. Vermont and Long Island. We don't live in the same world. Do you suppose Vermont and I will understand each other? I don't know much about Vermont, except what he's told me. He loves it, doesn't he? Ah, then I will, too. You know, Wainwright, I'm going to sell my house and my apartment, everything. Well, what's this? Case history, Miss Judith Traherne. Oh, Examination of the tissue samples proved the original diagnosis. The prognosis is definitely negative. Negative. Oh. oh. Wainwright? Yes? What does prognosis mean? It means what the future of a case looks like. What does negative mean? It means hopeless, a case that... Oh, Mr. Hearn, what is it? Mr. Hearn! I'm sorry I'm late, darling. I had a consultation. Oh, you look lovely. Have a drink. No, thanks. Another for me, waiter. Yes, Miss, right away. You should try one someday. I will, I will. Perhaps on our wedding day. Our wedding day. <laughs> What's the matter? Oh, could anything be? Hello. If I'm late, I'm sorry. Oh, don't be sorry, Anne, about anything. Sit down and join the party. We're playing games. Hide and seek. You can play, too. Puss in the corner. What are you talking about? Oh, I don't know. Of course, if you like, I'll leave. You two dear friends probably have a lot to talk over. My two dearest friends. Anne, have a cocktail. I'm going to have another. Yes, I'll have a cocktail. Oh, they're fine. They deaden the brain. You know about brains, Dr. Steele. They loosen inhibitions and make the tongue waggle. You should both have one. Are you quite well, Judith? You should know how well I am. Am I well, Doctor? 
Shh, it's a secret. Or wouldn't you know about secrets? Judith. I've meant to ask you, Doctor. Was I a specimen case? Will I make the medical journal? Why don't you tell me what this is about? Why don't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? Wait up. I think I'll have a large order of prognosis negative. What do you mean? You know, Earth, sur le plat. Prognosis negative. Do you know what prognosis negative means, Doctor? Explain to Anne. Or have you? A few months of pretending you're well. Then blindness, then... So long, my friend. Wait, Judith. We can't talk here, but... Yes, we can. It was a question of humor, the patient, wasn't it? Give the poor darling everything she wants. The time's so short. Marry her if necessary. Now I know why you went to his office that day. It was to beg him to marry me. Out of pity. You're both so kind. Thank you very much. Judith, you're wrong. Judith! Don't touch me, please. Let me go. Let me go. Just a moment, Mr. Daniel brings you Act Three of Dark Victory, starring Betty Davis and Spencer Tracy. When you hear something that interests you very much, you want to pass it on to your friends, don't you? Well, that's the way it is with new Quick Lux Flakes. Women all over the country are talking about it. For instance, here's just a paragraph from a letter Miss Peggy Tippett of Baltimore sent us. Oh, Sally, will you read the part I've marked, please? Mm -hmm. She says, I didn't think Lux could be improved, but you've done it. New Quick Lux is amazing. It's so fast and so gentle and so thrifty. It's grand. And I second her on that, Mr. Ruick. <laughs> yes, Sally, but uh, what else does she say? My sweaters look gorgeous after a dip in new Quick Lux Flakes. It's so gentle it leaves them soft and unshrunken. I keep all of my nice things new looking longer with this care. New Quick Lux has made me more than ever a Lux fan. Thanks, Sally. And like so many other women, Miss Tippett thought Lux flakes were just about tops, that they couldn't be any better. Well, we couldn't make them safer or more pure, but our scientists found that by adding a wonderful new ingredient, they could speed up the suds. New Quick Lux gives you suds in a second. The flakes are so fine, so sheer, they burst into suds at the touch of water. In water as cool as your hand, they dissolve three times faster than any of the ten other leading soaps tested. Flakes, chips, beads, bars. New Quick Lux makes faster suds. And it goes further. That's right. It makes more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of the other soaps tested. That means Lux is thrifty, doesn't it, Mr. Ruick? And that's good news to any woman. Yes, Sally. New Quick Lux costs you no more. Not one cent was added to the price. New Quick Lux is fast, it's thrifty, and it's safe. As mild and pure as ever. There's no harmful alkali to hurt any color or fabric that's safe in plain water. It helps your stockings, underthings, dresses, blouses, and sweaters stay new looking longer. Get a box of this amazing new Quick Lux Flakes tomorrow. Your grocer has it in the same familiar Lux package. Ask him for a large size box. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue with the third act of Dark Victory. With only a few months of life before her, Judith Traherne lives desperately, cramming her days and nights with excitement, striving vainly to forget. At a horse show in New York, her reckless jumping has won her first prize, and now she stands at the bar, receiving the congratulations of her friends. Miss Judith, can I speak to you? Well, Michael, what's the matter? I've got the horses packed. I wondered if you'd care to drive back with me. That mare's got bronchitis and can't possibly last the night. Jessica's girl? Yes. Why don't you put her out of her misery? I'll get there if I can. Ha! Kid! Kids, there's a tragedy for you. Ha! Jessica's girl has bronchitis and can't possibly last the night. Jessica's girl is a horse. Poor Jessica's girl. <laughs> oh, Judith, they want you outside. The presentation of the cup. Ah, yes, the darling little cup. Excuse me, kids. Judith. Well, if it isn't the extraordinary surgeon. I've tried to see you. How's your mortality rate these days, Doctor? Any more fun with the knives? Drop it, Judith. Why aren't you in Vermont with the bugs? You know why I'm not. I want to talk to you. When I need a doctor, I'll send for one. I'm not in your care any longer. You'll always be in my care. Will I? Is that part of your duty? 
To hang on until the very end and watch through those scientific eyes? Stop it. I know how you feel. Anything to strike back at me, but don't do it this way. What do you want me to do? Sit alone in my room and think how in a few months... Judith, I want you to find peace. We all have to die, Judith. The tragic difference is that you know when and we don't. The important thing is the same for all of us, to live our lives so we can meet death when it comes decently, beautifully, and finally. Finally. Beautifully. I'll die as I please. Leave me alone. Do you hate me so much? Oh, so much and for so many reasons. I hate you for not telling me the truth. I hate you for letting me hurl myself at your head. Oh, I'm so ashamed. I can understand. I'm sorry, Judith. Easy, girl. Easy, Jessica. That's the girl. Well, is she going to live, Michael? I guess so. It was touch and go for a while, but she's game. She put up a brave fight. How nice. Can I take you home, Miss Judith? No, thanks. I have a car. Well, I'll have it sent around. No, I'm not leaving yet. Michael, talk to me. <laughs> what shall I talk about? Oh, anything. Just talk. Tell me about you, Michael. <laughs> me? Yes, just as one human being to another. All right. Sure. Do you have a happy life, Michael? Not always. I have thoughts I have to smother down. Thoughts? What thoughts? I guess I was born out of my time, Miss Judith. I should have lived in the days when it counted to be a man. The way I like to ride and the way I like to fight. What good's riding and fighting and having good muscles these days? What do they get you? What do you want? I told you I have thoughts to smother down. Thoughts about you, Miss Judith. Why, Michael, you're making love to me. Well, you invited me to talk to you as a man, and it's as a man I'm talking. Surely I'm better than some of them that's playing around with you. They're afraid of you. Now, I've heard them talking. They'd go after you, but they're afraid. I wish that I was in their boots. Do you, Michael? <laughs> you wouldn't need to risk your lovely neck jumping horses for excitement. One of the nights I've laid awake thinking of you. The things I've wanted to say to you ever since the first time I saw you. Well, why don't you say them, Michael? We're of a kind. Will you belong to me and no one else? Kiss me, Judith. Oh, Michael, let me go. I'm only a stable hand, is that oh, it? No, no, it isn't that. I can't go on this way. Tonight it would be you, and after tonight, what? You again, or someone else, and so on and on until the last hour. Michael, I can't die like that. Die? What's this crazy talk about dying? I'm going to die in a few months, Michael. Does that frighten you? Heaven forgive you for saying anything like that. Yes, heaven forgive me. When it comes, it's got to be met finally, beautifully. That's what he said. Michael, I'm all shot. I'm all shot. Hello. Murray Hill, 77340, please. Judith? Is that you? Yes, Anne. Come in. Oh, it's so late, Judith. I was afraid something had happened to you. Hello? I see. Never mind, then. Whom are you calling? It doesn't matter. Business of apologizing to a gentleman for ruining his life. Really doesn't matter. Oh, Anne. I'm so tired. Let me put you to bed. Why? So I can dream. Oh, Judith, don't talk like that. Please, no. It's the waiting, Anne. Day and night. Anne, would it be wrong if I made it happen? Judith. Judith, darling, don't. Anne, and I, I must see him again just once before he goes away. Hello, Judith. Hello, Doctor. Come in. It is a fine time for a lady to be calling, isn't it? Oh, can you ever forgive me? I have already. Oh, but the things I said to you. It's good to say things, Judith. It gets them out. I do understand. Do you? Can you? You said you wanted me to find peace. Where is peace? Within yourself. I've tried to do the things I said I would. I couldn't. 
darling, there's been no one but you. Darling, how good it is to call you that again. You see, I had to come to tell you there's been no one. I couldn't go on with you bitter towards me. Please don't think of me like that. I love you, Judith. Yes, I believe you. It isn't just pity. Oh, I take back every unkind thing I said to you. Darling, help me. I've been so stupid. I've crammed every minute so full of waste. And now there's so little time, and I, I don't know what to do. With, and I'm afraid, and you're so right and strong. And I... Judith, Judith. It's all right now, Judith. If only you let me see you sometimes. You're going to see me every day. I'll show you what peace I can, Judith. You're coming with me to Vermont. Am I? Oh, no, 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 that wouldn't be fair to you. We'd only have... Forever. Will you marry me, Judith? Marry? Oh. Wouldn't it be marvelous if we could? A real wedding, given away in church bells and champagne. A white drop and orange blossoms and a wedding cake. Now, that's one thing I wouldn't have missed. And you're giving it to me. Oh, darling, I can never love you enough. Wow, oh, look, it's a letter from Anne. Is she coming up to see us? Well, not yet, but soon, I think. Listen, I've been trying to rent the house ever since your wedding, but no one seems to have any money, and I'm not going to let tramps have it. <laughs> Darling, tell me, why do people complicate their lives so? All those horses, that house. Here we have nothing. And yet we have everything. Everything. Are you supposed to be helping me, Anne? Where are the John Quiller bulbs? Oh, here. John Quiller, Narcissus, to be planted in early spring. Let me have them, darling. Won't they be beautiful next summer? How deep do you plant them? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, plant the bulbs about... And look four... how dark it's getting. It must be going to rain. Why, Judith? Well, it's getting darker every minute. We must be going to have a storm. Well, you know, that's funny. I can still feel the heat of the sun on my hands. I... Oh, no. Anne. Anne. No. No, it isn't oh, no. true. No, there are clouds. The sun has gone. A few hours of blindness. <laughs> no. Oh, no. Oh, it's there. Anne, Anne, it's all right. Oh, be quiet, darling. Hello. Hey, if the ladies' garden group can adjourn their meeting for a moment, I've got some news. Yes, darling. Start packing. We're going to New York. Wait a second. I'll be right out. Judith, you can't. Anne, you mustn't say a word, please. You mustn't. Judith. Judith, this is great news. What's happened? Look, a wire from Dr. Fisher in Philadelphia. Martha took it down over the phone. Here, read it. Well, well Anne, uh, Anne, you read it. I never could read Martha's writing. Dr. Frederick Steele, Brattleboro, Vermont. Wild with excitement over your latest experiment. Biological tests convince me you may be on right road with isolation. Isolation, see? Choke off the oxygen. Oh, no, you two wouldn't understand. Believe we should present material at board meeting in New York tomorrow. Please wire. My enthusiastic congratulations, Fisher. Oh, but darling, it's wonderful. Don't I know? I'm in the clouds. I wired Fisher. I meet him at 10 in the morning. Oh, did you? Yeah, it means driving over to Mills Junction to get the 440. Come on now. Give me a hand. I can't even find my socks. Judith, I'm going to tell Now, Anne, you must go right on with your planting, oh, but please. I... But you can't let him go. This is the chance he's been waiting for. The chance to help other people who are sick. He's got to go, Anne. If if I can only last till he goes. Judith. Anne, please. I know. Judith, you know what this means, don't you? If it's true, it means that in 10, 15, 25 years, I'll begin to get someplace. Oh, it's very exciting, isn't it? I'll say it is. Say, which one of those dresses do you want to wear, the gray or the black? D darling, I'm not going. What? Well, I, I'd rather not. You'll be busy, and I'd just be sitting around in a hotel room. Oh, somewhere. nonsense. Now, a couple of days in New York will do you good. You can buy some new clothes. But I don't need any new clothes. Well, you can see your friends. Now, please, darling, don't force me to go. Of course. Well, of course, darling. It's anything you want, but... Well, New York would bore me. Really, it would. This is my home now. I'd rather stay here. Judith, you're trembling. <laughs> Am I? Well, it's the first time we've ever been separated. Can't a girl get a little sentimental? Judith, I'm not going. I don't know what I could have been thinking about. I'll call Fisher and tell him. Darling, are you worried about me? 
Every minute you're not in my sight. Oh, but you needn't be, Anne's here. But if anything should happen? It won't, and even so, I'm not afraid anymore. I used to be. I died a thousand times. The next time, death will come as an old friend, gently and quietly. Judy. Ah, but we've had so much, darling. Just minutes. If we lived to be a hundred, we couldn't have had more. And when the time comes... When the time comes, I'll go with you. Oh, no. I swear I will. No, you won't. You couldn't be that unkind to me. I couldn't live without you, Judith. But darling, you must. I wouldn't want my death to be futile, meaningless. It is. Futile, meaningless, cruel. No, not if you live. If you can save others in the future who might die without you. Don't you see? You must go on with your work. You must wipe out this thing that's going to take me away from you. And with each blow you strike, you'll say, that was for Judith, my wife. Judith. Now, come on. No more nonsense. You go to New York, and I'll wait home as a proper wife should. Darling, tell me, have I been a good wife? Oh, my darling. That makes me very happy. Happier than anything else. You see, I've loved it so every minute. Oh, I... How can I make you understand? Look out there, out the window. Somehow it's been like that. Shining and quiet. Judith, I can't lose you. You'll never lose me, darling. Nothing can hurt us now, for what we've had can't be destroyed. Don't you see? That's our victory. Our victory over the dark. And it's a victory because we're not afraid. Now, come on, you'll miss your train. I don't want to go, Judith. Please, darling, here. Let me fix your tie. And for heaven's sakes, buy a new uh, hat. I made up a list of the places where we could be reached. We won't need it. I'll be back as soon as I can. I know you will. Judith. Kiss me goodbye, darling. Mind yourself in the big city. I'm going to be awfully lonely. Oh, don't tempt me. Go on. Goodbye, my darling. Goodbye. Goodbye, Judith. Hurry home. Hurry home, darling. <laughs> Did he... Did he go? Yes. Judith. And have you planted the hyacinths yet? I'd like to help you with them. You see, they're his favorite flowers. Here they are. I'm afraid I won't be much help, but if you'll dig the holes, I can drop in the seed. <laughs> Darling, you shouldn't. And please, dear. You see, I want to so very much. They should do well in the soil. Oh, the garden will be lovely in June, won't it, with everything blooming? I can see it. Anne, you will take care of my flowers, won't you? Water them well. Yes. And Anne, you will take care of my doctor. You know what I mean, Anne? Judith, please. You see, he'll need someone. He mustn't be alone. It's so much worse for him than me. I'm the lucky one. All I'll miss is growing old and being sick and tired and worn out. Promise me you'll never leave him. I promise. Anne, Anne, darling, darling, now don't cry, please. I'm very happy, really, I am. I, uh, I think I'll go in now. It's growing so very dark. I'll go with you. No, no, please understand, Anne. No one must be with me. No one. I have to prove to him that I can do it alone. Maybe it will help him over some bad moments in the future to remember it. Be my best friend, Anne. Just take me to the stairs and let me go up to my room alone. Yes, Judith. Yes. Thank you, Anne. I'll just go up and lie down for a while. The brief time that destiny allotted to Judith Traherne has ended. But it ends with the triumph of a gallant spirit as the curtain falls on her dark victory. In 
just a moment, Mr. DeMille returns with our stars. The other day, I was driving through Pasadena, and I stopped in at a grocery store for something. A couple of women were standing near me, giving their orders. Oh, yes. I want a large box of Lux Flakes, too. I hear they have a new Lux now. That's right. It's new Quick Lux. It's so fast, it suds in a second. Oh, that's wonderful. I want a couple of boxes, too. Well, naturally, that interested me. So I said to the grocer, looks like you're doing a rush business on Lux Flakes. <laughs> I'll say. That new Quick Lux is going like hotcakes. You know, it's a funny thing. I've heard plenty of my customers say they thought Lux just couldn't be any better. It's so safe and gentle. But darned if they haven't gone and made it suds faster. My wife says it makes just about the fastest suds she ever saw. She ought to know. She's tried lots of different soaps, and she thinks new quick Lux beats them all hollow. Yes, ladies, we've made Lux flakes so much faster. A wonderful new ingredient gives you suds in a second. The flakes are so fine and so sheer... They burst into suds at the touch of water. In water as cool as your hand, they dissolve three times faster than any of ten other leading soaps tested. Flakes, beads, bars, and chips. Yes, new Quick Lux gives faster suds. But that's not all. It goes further. It gives you more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of the other soaps tested. Do you know what that means? It means a little goes so far, it's thrifty. Really thrifty. Your grocer has this wonderful new Quick Lux right now in the same familiar Lux Flakes box. Ask him for it tomorrow. I know you'll like it. And remember, it costs you no more. It's so fast, so thrifty, and so safe for all your washables. For everything safe in water alone. Now, Mr. DeMille is bringing our stars to the microphone. If radio had an Academy Award, I'd present it to Betty Davis and Spencer Tracy as they return now for their curtain call. Thank you, C.B., I'd like to pay my respects to George Brent, who created this part so beautifully in the picture. Betty, it was wonderful to work with you again. And the same to you, Spence. You know, Mr. DeMille, when I first came to Hollywood, I was in one picture with Spence. Then we worked for different studios, and we've never appeared together since. That was eight years ago. Working with Spence in Dark Victory is particularly nice because it's my favorite play. <laughs> I think I can guarantee you that you'll be back here together before another eight years go by. Yeah, maybe the eight years was quite a victory for us after all. The title of the title of the picture we made was 20,000 Years in Sing Sing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well I, I hereby sentence both of you to report back soon with a play as good as Dark Victory. <laughs> what are you planning for the Lux Radio Theater next week, Mr. DeMille? Next Monday night, our star is Bing Crosby, and he's going to appear in Sing You Sinners. Bing will have the same role he played on the screen in the Paramount Picture Success. Sing You Sinners is a, is a gay comedy that combines adventure and romance. And in addition to Bing Crosby, we'll have Ralph Bellamy, Elizabeth Patterson, and Jacqueline Wells. Miss Patterson is from the original cast of Sing Your Sinners. I know we're all going to enjoy that, Mr. DeMille. Good night. So long, C.D. Good night. <laughs> Dark victory is a bright victory for both of you. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Bing Crosby in Sing You Sinners with Ralph Bellamy, Elizabeth Patterson, and Jacqueline Wells. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The part of Anne was played by Lorene Tuttle. Fred Shields was heard as Michael, Wright Kramer as Dr. Parsons, Martha Wentworth as Miss Wainwright, Clara Blandick as Martha, Lou Merrill as Colonel Mantle, and Nancy Leach as a nurse. Spencer Tracy appeared through the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor and has just completed this studio's production of Northwest Passage. Betty Davis is now starring on the screen in the Warner Brothers picture Elizabeth and Essex. The play Dark Victory was written by George Brewer and Bertram Block. The Warner Brothers screenplay was written by Casey Robinson. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>